and welcome back again to A Culture. This is a very interesting thing because it's a live talk from the original A Culture Festival in 2001. It's Colin Wilson, who, as far as I'm concerned, is one of the godfathers uh, of the A Culture because he talked about subjects in the 50s and 60s and 70s which were unheard of, almost forbidden, forbidden archaeology, things like that that other people have claimed as their own. He is the man who built those foundation blocks for Graham Hancock and later authors. Colin Wilson here is talking about Atlantis and it's a very controversial talk because I think he even fell out with his co-author, but here he is, the transcendent Sorry, Colin Wilson. Um, so I guess the best thing to do is just uh, let him make all his own excuses, ladies and gentlemen, Colin Wilson. Before I get around to that, I want to try to summarize what I think is my absolute basic idea, which seems to me to explain such an enormous amount. I realized years ago that we all of us have a kind of robot inside us whose purpose is to do things for us, it's a kind of servant. So for example, um, you learn something consciously, like uh, typing, or a um, you know, foreign language, or riding a bicycle, and then in no time at all, this robot takes it over from you, and does it far more efficiently than you could. The only problem is that if you then try to interfere with the robot, once it's got something properly taped, you screw it up completely. So that, for example, if somebody says to you, um, which um, foot do you use for the brake in your car? You have to wiggle your foot to find out. Your body knows the answer, but you've kind of forgotten it. The robot has taken over. Now the problem with the robot is that he not only does all the things you want him to do, like, you know, talking French and driving the car, but he also does the things you don't want him to do. He's kind of like a thermostat, which cuts in as soon as you get a bit tired. And this is very useful if you're driving home from work, and you discover, you know, that the robot has driven you home and you can't remember it. But on the other hand, if you listen to a piece of music that moves you very deeply for the first time, the fifth or sixth time you listen to the music, it's the robot listening instead of you, or rather listening as well as you and preventing you from really concentrating and enjoying the music. In the same way, um, if you went for a, a country walk on holiday and you suddenly discover that the thing is absolutely beautiful and you feel completely carried away, the reason that the second time you do the same walk you can't get carried away is that the robot is now walking at the side of you and is taking over a great many of the things that you would prefer to feel yourself. This is our most basic problem. There are two people inside you. There's the real you, and there's this robot servant, which is immensely useful. I mean, we human beings are the most efficient animals on the surface of the earth because we have this robot servant. He can do all kinds of things for us. But the problem is that because we have this immensely efficient robot, it prevents us from feeling the things that we really want to feel deeply. Sometimes when you do something under crisis with a feeling that, you know, this is so important that you've got to get it right, then the robot moves completely out of the way 
and you can really do it on your own, the real you. And of course these are also the times when you set out on a holiday or something of the sort, and suddenly, you know, as you're bowling along the road and looking at the fields and the trees and the sunlight, you suddenly get this immense feeling of happiness, which is once again the real you taking over. So, as I say, this is our basic problem. Now, the problem is that you could say that you are 50% real you and 50% robot. That's the average kind of distribution in the modern civilized person. Now, when you suddenly get these strange moments of happiness, you suddenly become 51% real you and only 49% robot. On the other hand, as soon as you begin to get tired and the robot begins to take over, you suddenly become 51% robot and 49% real you. And you're just aware that you're no longer enjoying your life, you're no longer feeling in the same way that you felt when, you know, you're feeling thoroughly wide awake. Now, sometimes, of course, you get these sort of moments of marvellous happiness when you're really carried away. You know, the things that um, Maslow took called peak experiences. And, um, you know, I can see from the expression on some of your faces that you know about Maslow already. He was this American psychologist who wrote to me in 1958. He'd read a book of mine called The Age of Defeat. And he sent me some of his papers. And the things that really influenced me very deeply were these papers on what he called the peak experience. Um, Maslow said that he got sick as a psychologist of studying people who were sick because sick people talked about nothing but the sickness. And so he decided that instead of that, he looked around for the healthiest people he could find. So he asked among his friends, who's the healthiest person you know? And, you know, he got introduced to a great many of these healthy people. And he quickly discovered something that no one had ever discovered before, that all of these healthy people had with great frequency what Maslow called peak experiences, these bubbling experiences of sheer overwhelming happiness. Mostly when they were doing perfectly ordinary things. Um, for example, a young mother was giving her husband and kids breakfast one morning when a beam of sunlight came in through the window and she suddenly thought, aren't I lucky? And went into the peak experience. Now, what was so interesting is that Maslow found out that when he talked to his students about peak experiences, they began remembering peak experiences which they'd had in the past and forgotten about. And you know, they'd suddenly come up with some particular time when, you know, they were on holiday or were completely relaxed. Um, one of his students said that he was drumming his way through college as a jazz drummer. And one night, suddenly at about two o'clock in the morning, he was drumming so perfectly that he could not do a thing wrong. And he said he just went into the peak experience. Now you can see what happens in the peak experience in the case of the jazz drummer. Quite suddenly, he went up from sort of 52% real you to 53%. The needle sort of swung right up. And when you get into that state, everything goes right. Not only does everything go right, but you have an odd sort of feeling that you are in charge of your destiny, that nothing is going to go wrong. And that's because you've got a curious feeling of happiness and inner pressure inside yourself. And somehow, you know, you know, everything's okay. I've also noticed that whenever I get into these states, I also get weird synchronicities. And whenever I'm feeling sort of, you know, spiritually fairly healthy, synchronicities tend to occur. Let me, if I may, mention what seems to be one of the most interesting synchronicities I've ever come across. There's a friend of mine called Jacques Vallée, who's very interested in flying saucers. 
one of the great experts on the subject. Now, Jacques <clears throat> was terribly interested in a cult um, in Los Angeles called the Cult of Melchizedek, who is a minor biblical prophet. And he just wanted to find out all he could about the original Melchizedek. And there's nothing on Melchizedek at all. And uh, finally, he got to the stage where, you know, he was really searching the web for Melchizedek. And at that point, he took a taxi to Los Angeles Airport, and he asked the lady driver if she could give him a receipt, and she gave him a receipt signed M. Melchizedek. So I thought, oh, that's interesting. Um, there must be lots of Melchizedeks around in Los Angeles. So I went and looked in the LA phone directory, which is this big. One Melchizedek, his taxi driver. <laughs> and he got that one. Well, I was telling this story in uh, an article I was writing about synchronicity for an encyclopedia of unsolved mysteries. And uh, when I finished telling the story, I got up to go for the walk with my dogs, which I do sort of around about four in the afternoon. And as I got up, I noticed on the sort of camp bed, which is opposite my typewriter, a book which I hadn't seen before, which had obviously fallen off the shelf. I knew it was my book because I'd sent it off for binding at Remploy. And I picked up this thing, and it was called um, You Are Condemned to Life by some Los Angeles um, doctor. So I went upstairs and I tossed it onto my chair to have a look at when I got back from my walk. When I got back from my walk, I opened the book and the first thing I saw across the top of the page was Cult of Melchizedek. <laughs> and it was a letter from the founder of the Cult of Melchizedek in Los Angeles, a lady called Grace Hooper Pettifer, to the author of the book. And I just told this story of Jack Valley, and it was almost as if some fate was saying to me, <laughs> you think Jack's thing is really an extraordinary synchronicity? I'll top that. And instantly produce this one. Preposterous. There is definitely something that cuts in when you get very happy and on top of things, and which seems to make things go right. And it's a kind of determination on your part to concentrate, not to let things go downhill. I'll tell you an interesting story in this respect. Earlier this year, I had to go to Cardiff to um, lecture. And uh, the next morning, Joy and I went out to have a look around the centre of Cardiff. No, I don't want to go to beach in Cardiff, but it's the bloody most boring dump in the world. <laughs> and uh, we were walking along this great concrete kind of cavern from the hotel, you know, the kind of motorway going into the middle of Cardiff. And I was just thinking, oh Christ, what am I doing in this place? And I thought, you know, no, don't take that attitude. You know, you suddenly feel when, when things look really boring around you, you feel a kind of sinking inside you. And, of course, what happens when you get the sinking inside you is you go onto the robot. And I stopped myself doing that. And I really made an effort of will and concentration not to sink to this lower level. And I pulled myself out of it by sheer focus. And, you know, we got out of this sort of awful area and into the centre of Cardiff. Then we went into some big store where Joy wanted to buy some aspirin or something of the sort. And suddenly she said, you know, I've got this awful sore throat coming on. All my family had had sore throats before we set out. And so we suddenly had to sort of stop looking around for vitamin C and all this kind of thing for her. But the fact that I'd made that effort of concentration kept me on top of the situation instead of going underneath. And then we walked around for a bit and I took her along to the Cardiff Art Gallery and served her some pictures of Greg John and things of that sort. We finally went back to the hotel, whereupon the poor girl retired to bed and stayed in bed all weekend with a filthy sore throat you've ever seen. But it seemed to me that by deliberately saying, no, no, don't let go, don't sink into a lower state, pull yourself together, I'd actually succeeded in pulling myself out of this low state. I knew it lasted all that weekend. 
Now that seems to me to be immensely important. That kind of insight that came to me there and is the essence in a way of what I've got to say. It's this fact that the real you is always waiting for the opportunity to grab that extra 5% and really suddenly to get in charge. But that if you can just remember to do it rather than, you know, just letting it happen because like Maslow's housewife, the sunbeam suddenly comes in through the window. If you can force yourself to do it, this is the right way. Now, to summarize this, you can say that you are 50% real you and 50% robots and you like it all the time. You're not really aware of it because, you know, you seem to be real you all the time. The real you is behind your eyes looking out of the world. But you're aware of that feeling that, you know, you're not really doing things at your best. And what you can actually do if you recognize that is to begin to actually concentrate like mad and push yourself to a higher level. And this seems to me, you know, one of the most important things I've discovered. You know, it's taken me all my life. I was 71 a week ago. And um, you sort of think, well, you know, maybe I've got another 10 years of life left with a little buck. And uh, you realize that when you discover this particular secret, there could be 10 intensely important and interesting years rather than, you know, just sort of drifting along. And the worst you might be able to hold death off indefinitely. I'm sure this is what Bernard Shaw meant when he said that men are intended to live to be 300. Anyhow, let me get on with this um, business of Atlantis. Um, I got interested in this subject because a man called John Anthony West had written a book called Serpent in the Sky, which I reviewed in 1979. One of the things he said in Serpent in the Sky was that he felt that the ancient Egyptians had produced such an incredibly high level of culture and religion and, you know, medicine and all kinds of other accomplishments that they couldn't possibly have done this in the short time in which they were supposed to have done it. As you know, um, ancient Egypt was supposed to have started around about 3100 BC. And yet within 500 years, <laughs> they were building the Great Pyramid. And John said that, you know, it doesn't happen that fast. It took Europe far, far longer to build the cathedrals. You know, it takes over a thousand years. It just doesn't happen in 500 years. And his theory was that in point of fact, what was happening was that the Egyptians were, had already had a culture which had come in from elsewhere. And Gurdjieff says, somewhere in all and everything, you know, Beelzebub's tales, that in fact this culture came from Atlantis. This is some sort of a major ancient tradition. Anyway, I was fascinated by this, and I thought I'd rather like to get around to writing about this sometime. And so, around about 1990, I started thinking of doing a book about this. And then I began to get these interesting synchronicities. The first one was that John Anthony West, with whom I'd never been in contact, suddenly wrote to me out of the blue, saying, I wonder if you've seen all this new and interesting stuff which is happening about the Sphinx. What had happened was that John had read somewhere in a rather peculiar um, Egyptologist called Shwala de Lubix. Um, Shwala was um, an extremely strange eccentric whose ideas resembled Gurdjieff's in many ways. He read in Shwala de Lubix the assertion that the uh, Sphinx had not been weathered by wind-blown sand, but by water. They said, you've only got to look at it to see that. Well, John was fascinated, and he tried to persuade various geologists to go along with him to look at the Sphinx enclosure. And uh, most of these geologists just did not want to go, because they didn't want to stick their neck out that far because they all had academic jobs. But finally, um, he did succeed in persuading a geologist to go along with them, and he was sure he got something completely wrong with his um, 
with his serendipity. He asked Robert Shock, what do you think? And Shock looked at him and said, yeah, that's water weathering. It's quite different from Wimbledon Sand. Now, you may say, what a difference does it make? Obviously, in a country like Egypt, where there's almost no rain, it makes an enormous difference. I mean, Egypt, the re reason Egypt is full of sand is that they don't get enough rain. And what this appeared to show was there must have been a time when there had been a lot of rain. The reason you see that he could tell that the Sphinx was water weather, he was talking mainly about the Sphinx enclosure, which is kind of, you know, three sides of steep rock walls. He said there's a complete difference when you look very closely at something like that. He said, what happens when you've got um, weathering from windblown sand is that the layers of the sandstone go sort of in and out like that. Because, you know, the sand is blown against them like a sun blaster, and it blasts away the soft stuff and leaves the hard stuff sticking out. He said, now, water weathering is completely different because the water comes down from the top and actually cuts grooves down the whole lot. And although, once again, it wears away the soft stuff and leaves the hard stuff, you can see that it looks different because instead of getting grooves all the way along in straight lines, you've got something looking more like a series of baby's bottoms where the water is run down. He said, you know, you've only got to look at this and you can see that that's what it's like. So anyway, John was immensely impressed by this. This was presented to a conference of geologists in um, California in about 1992. And they were fascinated because they were quite open-minded. They tended to agree that this had definitely been water weathered. And John said, yeah, well, what kind of date do you think that this could have happened? So Schott looked at it <clears throat> for a long time and said, well, I don't know, my guess would be about 7,000 BC. Now, of course, the point about the Sphinx and the Pyramid is they were supposed to have been made together around about 2,500 BC. So it immediately added this 4,500 years. And um, anyway, this caused tremendous controversy, and this was the stuff that John sent me. And he'd actually um, looked at the face of the Sphinx, which is quite badly damaged, as you know. And what he wanted to know was um, whether this face could have been the face of the man who was supposed to have built it. It was a, a pharaoh called Chephron. Um, and um, he, there is, fortunately, a bust of Chephron in the Cairo Museum. So what he did was to take along an expert from New York in forensic um, medicine, but also in making sketches of dead bodies. And he showed him the picture of Jeffrey, and then he took him along to the Sphinx. What the expert did was, in fact, to draw sort of lines and so on to show where the Sphinx originally would have, where the cheeks, the angle of the cheeks of the eyes and all the rest of it. And at the end of it, he said, no, that's not Jeffrey. Completely different type of face. And so all of this notion that, in fact, the Sphinx had been built by Jeffrey, the son of Cheops, went out of the window. So, of course, all this stuff fascinated me. And I decided I would write a book about this. So, when I was in New York, around about 1953, um, I arranged to go and meet John. And um, I took him out to dinner that evening with my family. Was it 93, darling? Did I say 53? Sorry. <laughs> I took um, John out to dinner with my family and uh, John said um, have you heard about um, this man Graham Hancock and I said no who's Graham Hancock and he said well he's an interesting character and he's written a book about the question of the Ark of the Covenant and um, where the Ark disappeared to he said that he's working at the moment on a theory that civilization is thousands and thousands of years older than anybody thinks. And he's fascinated by this stuff of mine about the things. So he gave me Graham's address. And he said, and by the way, have you heard about a man called Rantler Math? And I said, my God, no, what a name. 
is that his real name? He said, no, no. He said, actually, his real name is Fleming, and he married a girl called <coughs> Death, and he decided to incorporate these two names together. No, no, that's a stupid idea. <laughs> anyway, so he uh, gave me Rand's address as well. Well, when I got back to England, I dropped a line to Graham Hancock, and very obligingly, <coughs> Graham immediately sent me this huge typescript of his book, Fingerprints of the Gods. I also wrote to Rand from the mouth. Rand wrote to me and sent me the manuscript of a book that he and his wife had written. And the basic idea of this book was that um, Atlantis was not some island in the mid-Atlantic Ocean, but was, in point of fact, Antarctica, the South Pole. Now, <clears throat> in fact, a man called Charles Hapgood, who was um, a professor at um, a small college in New England, and also got very interested in this question um, of Earth's crust and that kind of thing quite a few years earlier. What had happened briefly was this. Hapgood had said to his students, um, look, you're all curious about um, places like Atlantis and Lemuria. Why don't you go away and re research it for me and you know, bring me in the results of your researches? He just wanted to get them to do some original work. He was quite convinced that Atlantis was a lot of nonsense. Now, as you know, <clears throat> the man who was responsible for the story of Atlantis is Plato. He did it in a couple of dialogues called the Critias and the Timaeus, and the second of which is unfinished. And uh, so um, he became uh, interested in this notion that a Plato's account of the sinking of Atlantis, which, as you know, is supposed to have disappeared in a day and a night. Plato gives the date for this, which you can work out, because he said that it was approximately 9,000 years before the time of his ancestor Solon, the Greek statesman, which would make it about, say, 9,500 BC. Anyway, um, Rand had become uh, interested in all this kind of thing. The aspect of Hapgood that had interested Rand very much was that Hapgood had got so fascinated by Atlantis that he thought, what the hell could, in fact, destroy a civilization in a day and a night? Because when he read Plato, he really felt that Plato appeared to be telling this as a genuine piece of history. It really does convince you as you read it. And so, Hapgood began trying to work this out. And one day, in his kitchen, he put a rug in the dryer. And what actually happened is that the rug bunched up in one corner of the dryer. And as you know, when you do that and the dryer is whirling around at top speed, it begins to jutter like mad. And it tore the bolts out of the floor. And Hapgood found himself thinking, aha, oh, oh, could that be the answer? The Earth has an enormous amount of ice, particularly, you know, in the polar caps. Now, the North Pole doesn't count because the polar ice is entirely floating on seawater. But the South Pole is a different matter. That's solid land underneath. And he thought, you know, if the ice built up, and it's two miles deep, over Antarctica. If the ice built up enough, as the Earth is whirling around like a washing machine, couldn't the ice, if it was slightly lopsided, cause a juddery effect? We could, in fact, explain why there'd been this great catastrophe. Well, he got a friend of his, a mathematician, to work it out. The mathematician looked at Antarctica, the ice over Antarctica, and he said, no, he doesn't figure out, really. There's just not enough ice. And so Hapgood was rather disappointed by what seemed him a good theory until another friend of his said, wait, you know, your whole earth doesn't have to judder. Do you realize that the crust of the earth, in fact, is only about 40 miles thick? And down below the crust, it's pure liquid, molten rock, lava, and that kind of thing. 
He said, now, if in fact the earth's trust could slip, that might explain what had happened to Atlantis. And then, of course, you've got to work out why the earth's trust slipped. Well, Hapgood nevertheless settled down to start studying and researching all this. And the first thing um, he thought of was that the iron in the Earth's surface, when it solidifies, its molecules are like little arrows pointing in the direction of the magnetic North Pole. And if it solidifies, they stick there, pointing in the direction perfect, all the time, permanently. Now, Hapgood studied various um, sort of geologists talking about the Earth's starter and the North Pole, and realized that, in fact, most of the molecules in the iron in the Earth are not pointing to the present North Pole. They're pointing 2,000 miles south of it to the middle of Hudson Bay. <laughs> Which makes it sound as if, at some point, the North Pole, in fact, had been in the middle of Hudson Bay. Now, if you think of that for a moment, you see that in point of fact, that's, it's not really a matter of the North Pole being in the middle of Hudson Bay. What we're really talking about is the slippage of the Earth's crust. Think of a schoolboy wearing a cap, and you pull down the cap over his eyes, and you can see that although his eyes disappear, they remain in the same place, really. They're just under the peak of his cap. And the same goes with the North Pole. If the whole of the Earth's crust slipped, the North Pole would stay in the same place. But of course, if the Earth's sl crust slipped 2,000 miles south, what appeared to be the North Pole would actually be now the middle of Hudson Bay. So anyway, this was fact. There wasn't any doubt about it at all. And what's more, Hapgood discovered that this great slippage of the Earth's crust, 2,000 miles, this great slippage had occurred round about 10,000 BC. And so it looks as if Hapgood has finally got a mechanism for the disappearance of Atlantis, the slippage of the Earth's crust. Well, he got so excited about this that he wrote off to Albert Einstein and said, look, you know, I've come up with this extremely interesting theory. And Einstein, who was a very open-minded person, said, you know, okay, let me see um, your facts. So, Hapgood sent him all this stuff he'd written, and Einstein said, yes, it looks to me as if you're onto something. He said, let me see if I can get you a grant from the Carnegie Foundation and, um, you know, get you a chance to do some real work on this. But anyway, Einstein didn't succeed, and Hapgood was pretty disappointed about all this. But he nevertheless wrote a book called Earth Shifting Crust, whose theme was this fact that the Earth's crust can slip. Of course, he didn't dare to mention Atlantis. It would have been more than his job was worth as an academic. And uh, nevertheless, he published the book, and it was panned by all the academics who said, what the hell is this professor of um, history doing writing about geology? But anyway, just at that point, he discovered another rather interesting fact. And this was that um, there was a map, which you've all heard of, called the Pili Rice map, which was created by a Turkish pirate in the year 1513. Or was it 1514? I don't remember. Anyway, 50 years before Shakespeare, approximately. And this map shows the whole coast of South America, which had never been explored then. I mean, people just did not know about the coast of South America. It also shows the Africa, was it? And it also shows a bit of land at the bottom, beyond the point of South America, which looks very like a bit of Antarctica. But the odd thing about it, if you look at this periodized map, which you can see in almost any volume of Eric Mondaini can or something so on, um, if you look very closely at this periodized map, you see there are great bays in the coast of, of um, Antarctica. And of course, those bays don't exist because they're covered in two miles of ice. However, 
1957, there was a World Geographical Survey which sent sonar waves down through the ice in Antarctica, which discovered these enormous bays underneath the surface, under, underneath two miles of ice, which showed the proper configuration of the coast of Antarctica. Well, <clears throat> this got everybody terribly excited. It's around about 1952. And um, because it looked as if somebody had made a map of the coast of Antarctica when it didn't have any ice. And the last time the coast of Antarctica didn't have any ice was around about 5,000 BC. And in 5,000 BC, there was no writing. Writing was created by the Sumerians around about 3,500 BC. And you can't have a map without writing on. What's the good of a map without writing on? So it looks as if writing must have existed around about 5,000 BC. And you know, I'm just guessing 5,000 BC because we don't know when the coast of Antarctica was free of ice. But anyway, um, Hapgood was fascinated by this. So he went along to the Library of Congress and said, no, you got any more of these maps? And they said, oh yeah, we've got lots and lots. Come and have a look. And so Hapgood went along to this room in the Library of Congress, me and then myself. They put out all of these maps on great big trestle tables for him to look at. And he was amazed. You see, these maps are, are um, called portolands, which means from port to port. And they were used by medieval mariners for um, getting around from port to port. Now the interesting thing about these maps is that they're incredibly accurate. But you see, all of the maps that were being made around about the time of Shakespeare and so on were completely inaccurate. I've got one of them that's got England shaped like a teapot. And so, clearly, these maps must have been based upon far, far older maps. And Hapgood finally worked out with his students that these maps must have been made from maps that dated back to the time of Alexander the Great, around about 350 BC. But, you know, nobody knew anything about any such maps. Now, one of these maps of the South Pole that Hapgood looked at really took his breath away. It was um, made by a Frenchman called Philip Brush, around about, I don't know, 1650 or something. It showed the whole of Antarctica without any ice. Antarctica, actually, is two continents because it has a great big crack across the middle, but the crack can't be seen anymore because it's under two miles of ice. This map showed Antarctica with a big crack across the middle. And what's more, showed rivers, mountains, all of which are now buried under ice. And so it appeared that, in fact, somebody had made a map of Antarctica when there was no ice on it at all. And there it was in the Library of Congress and lots of other similar maps. Now, <clears throat> what uh, fascinated Hapgood so much, who would want to make a map of the middle of Antarctica? I mean, you know, if you're a sailor sailing around the outside, you'd need a map showing the coastline of Antarctica, but you wouldn't bother with the middle of Antarctica. The only people who want a map of the middle of Antarctica would be people who live there. And of course, all this began to come together. The thought, okay, so Antarctica was once an inhabited continent. It must have been a great deal warmer, but it was a great deal warmer because it was 2,000 miles further north. It hadn't slipped so far south. So it began to look more and more as if Rand could be right. And Atlantis was, in fact, Antarctica. Well, anyway, um, Rand wrote off to Charles Hapgood and said, you know, this is fascinating stuff, and went on to make such intelligent observations that Hapgood wrote back and said, you know, you're the first person who's really understood my theory. Well, Rand was so fascinated by it that he promptly went off to London to study ancient maps in the British Museum. And <clears throat> when he'd been there two or three years with his wife, he dropped Hapgood a line telling him what he had discovered in his researches. This was 1989, and he got back the most incredible letter from Hapgood. This letter said, 
you will be interested to hear that recent amazing discoveries have convinced me that civilization with a fairly high degree of culture has existed for a hundred thousand years. Now you know that's preposterous. A hundred thousand years? You know, civilization, well, it's supposed to be you know, sort of 6,000 BC, that means about 8,000 years old. 100,000 years! So, Rand wrote back and said, quick, tell me, tell me, why? And his letter was returned stamped, deceased. How would have walked in front of a car and been killed? Well, Rand uh, proceeded to write to all Hapwood's relatives and say, do you happen to have any, um, any stuff, any of his papers <coughs> with the notes he made? Because what um, Hapwood has said in his letter around was that he intended to put this new stuff he'd found about the age of civilization into a new edition of Earth Shifting Crust, which had in any case been reissued under the title of the Path of the Pole. And um, Rand got nowhere at all. Just nowhere. But nevertheless, he got very fascinated by this stuff. And one of the things that fascinated him most was Hapwood's comment that the North Pole had once been in Hudson Bay, around about 10,000 BC. Now, <clears throat> Rand was very interested in the sacred site north of Mexico City called Teotihuacan. This was the kind of, you could call it the ancient Rome of that period. And it's quite an extraordinary place. Huge pyramids looking out the pyramids of Egypt. And uh, <clears throat> out of Teotihuacan to the north there's a great wide road which is now known as the Way of the Dead. The interesting thing about this road is you would think the road out of a place like Teotihuacan would be going due north. This, in fact, was going about three degrees off due north. And Rand realized that if he extended the line of the way of the dead, it went through Hudson Bay. And then he discovered a book by an archaeologist called Philip Aveni, which said that there were 49 more sacred sites in Mexico which also were aligned two or three degrees wrongly. Instead of pointing due north, they were pointing just a bit over that way. So, Rand thought, my God, you can see why he was so startled by all this. I mean, Teotihuacan is supposed to be maybe, I don't know, 450 BC. So, you know, why? had you suddenly got this road pointing out to the Hudson Bay Pole, which hadn't been there for, since 10,000 BC. Something very odd going on. Anyway, Rand began to study other sacred sites around the world to see whether he could discover any more along this line. And what he found startled him. Again and again, the sacred sites appeared to have been placed in such a way that they pointed quite precisely, like signposts, to the Hudson Bay Pole. Now that could only mean one thing, that in fact there must have been a worldwide civilization in the days of the Hudson Bay Pole, around about 10,000 BC, when there wasn't supposed to be anything. And of course, that civilization, <coughs> Rand thought, was Atlantis. Or at least Atlantis was an immensely important part of it. And he appeared to be putting together information about this. And one of the most interesting things Rand came across was this. Around about um, 1880, the countries of Europe began to discuss where to put the central um, line of latitude and longitude, which now goes through Greenwich. And the French wanted it to go through Paris, the Berliners wanted to go through Berlin. And so on. <clears throat> Finally, the English won out, and it became the, um, the Greenwich Meridian. But Rand, looking at all this, thought, 
If, in fact, you lived in the ancient world, so, you know, two or three thousand years earlier, where would you choose the naught degrees meridian to go through? And the more he looked at the geography of this, the more he came to the same conclusion, the Great Pyramid. Now, as soon as he began, in fact, to work upon this assumption that maybe the central meridian had gone through the Great Pyramid, the more things began to make sense. I mean, for example, there are all kinds of sites all over the world, like, you know, Tiapanaco in Bolivia, which has these immense ruins, which seem to date from way before um, 5000 BC. When um, you take the latitude and longitude of Tiapanaco from Greenwich, you know, it gives you something like sort of 69.73 degrees or something, meaningless. Since you take it from Giza, precisely 100 degrees. And he found that again and again, the important sacred sites fell in tens, 100, 110, 120, and so on. So what he appeared to have proved was that this ancient civilization must, in fact, have had its central meridian going down through Giza, through the Great Pyramid. It was interesting, at one point Randy even wrote to me and said, you know, if um, Tiapanaco is, a, I forget what, say 57 degrees north of the equator, if my theory is correct, there ought to be another place exactly 57 degrees south of the equator on the um, same longitude. He said, I've looked in my um, atlas, but all I can find is a place called Lubantum in um, British Columbia. <laughs> and I wrote back, have you never heard of Lubantum, one of the greatest of the Maya sacred sites, where the famous crystal skull is supposed to have been discovered? You've probably seen this crystal skull if you've ever seen any of those Arthur Clarke um, you know, pr programs on television, because it all started off with a beautiful picture of this marvellous crystal skull, Lubantu. Randy discovered Lubantu not using his theory. So all of this seemed to be tremendously interesting. It seemed to be, you know, that Rand had really got somewhere. And the result was, <clears throat> when Rand said to me, would you like to work with me on a book about this? I said, yeah, wonderful. I'd be happy to do it. And so the two of us began to work together. Well, I immediately began to discover some very, very interesting things. One of the most interesting things I came across was this. Joy and I were um, going down the Nile, looking at various Egyptian temples and this sort of thing. And the people in the next cabin said to me, I'll look at this book, it's very interesting. It's by a French um, engineer who, in fact, um, did the electronics on the first moon shot, a man called um, Maurice Chatelain. And they lent me this book, which is um, called Our Cosmic Ancestors. And I thought, oh Christ, here we go, bloody Danikin again. <laughs> but um, as I read through this book, I came across some things that really made my hair stand on end. One of these things was this. Around about 1850, archaeologists began to discover, um, in what is now Iraq, these immense ruins of ancient cities, you know, places like Nineveh and so on. And one of the things they discovered in Nineveh was an enormous library of clay tablets that belonged to King Ashurbanipal, who was one of the great Assyrian kings. And one of these clay tablets contained enormous numbers extraordinarily big numbers. Well, the man who, called Smith who discovered these wasn't a mathematician, then he just sent them back to the British Museum. It was only much later that people began to look very closely at these tablets of Ashurbanipal and wonder what they held these enormous numbers were. I mean, one of these numbers was 15 digits long. You know, the Assyrians who existed around about, you know, 7-800 BC just probably did not have the brain power to handle the digits of that size. I mean, it was something like 195 billion billion, taking billion 
in the sense of a million million, not in the sense of the American sense of a thousand million. So anyway, um, Shatter then came across this. It was fascinating. Thought, what on earth can that number of that size be? And at that point, you remember something interesting. The Assyrians <coughs> were descended directly from the Babylonians, and the Babylonians were directly descended from the Sumerians, who were the people who were supposed to have invented writing. Now, what you remember then was that, in fact, the Sumerians were the people who had invented seconds. You know, 60 seconds to a minute, 60 minutes to an hour. And in fact, instead of their mathematics being based upon 10, as our mathematics is, it was based upon the number 60. And so, the thought came into Chatelain's head, I wonder if this 195 billion billion could be seconds. So he proceeded to work it out using the NASA computer and discovered that in point of fact it came to way over 6 million years. Well, this still didn't get any much further. But um, he then remembered something else. And that is something called precession of the equinoxes. Um, I don't know whether you know what precession of the equinoxes is. But in point of fact, the Earth's axis has a slight kind of wobble on it. Imagine a great big pencil stuck through the hole of the middle of the Earth. Now what tends, to, what, what tends to happen is that um, as the Earth goes around the Sun, the axis doesn't remain dead straight with the Earth whirling around it. It wobbles slowly. In other words, if you imagine an enormous searchlight beam in the north end pointing at the sky and another one in the south end, it's causing a great circle in the heavens, so to speak. Now, to us on Earth, this great circle in the heavens actually makes it look as if something which is called the vernal point, um, which is the point in the heavens where the spring equinox arises, is going backwards. You know, for example, that we're now living in the age of Pisces. And in around about 800 time, uh, years' time, we shall be in the age of Aquarius. And in fact, you know, to take 800 years, we'll be here tomorrow. But in point of fact, this uh, fact that we are changing from year to year, but backwards, you see, as you know, the ordinary zodiac goes forwards. And so, in point of fact, you know, like the, um, like the, the science of the zodiac, you know, newspaper astrology. And so you sort of get to Aquarius, <clears throat> followed by Pisces, followed by the, you know, Taurus and so on. Um, now, in point of fact, this is all going backwards the other way. And so we were in the age of Taurus nearly 2,000 years ago because of this thing called precession, which is actually due to this wobble. And precession takes around just under 26,000 years to complete its course. In other words, for the searchlight to go around a complete circle in the heavens and to get back to its beginning. Now, you would think that something as weird as that would be known to very few people indeed. But in point of fact, all the ancients knew about it. We don't know why, but they did. Now, one reason was the ancients were fascinated by the heavens, and nearly all of them were great astronomers. You see, their religion was based upon this watching these strange changes in the heavens, which they felt were of immense significance. They thought that the gods were giving them a clue to their purpose, and so they studied them very intently. But just think of it, studying it for you know, 26,000 years. It's an immensely long period. It's actually something like, you know, 29,986, something like that. So, what Chatelain did was to try dividing 25,986 into this huge number of six million odd. And to his amazement, he came up absolutely precise, 240 times. Whoever had created this enormous number had deliberately made it 240 times the length of the complete great circle 
Some people call it the Platonic year. Now, <clears throat> he also discovered that in South America, there are a couple of huge slabs full of numbers discovered in a place called Quiriga. When he examined these once again, you've got a huge vast numbers. But of course, the Maya who had created them worked in days, not in seconds. And so he translated these once again um, into years, tried dividing them by the number of the precession of the equinoxes. Once again, it was exact. The Maya also knew this thing. Now you can see there's something very weird about this. All these ancient people studying the heavens like that and coming up with these amazing giant numbers. Why? Now, at this point, Chatelain began to wonder whether, in fact, um, some of these giant numbers um, took account of something which, um, in those days, um, was called um, the planetary constant or something of the sort. It was believed that every number in the solar system, every not just the planets, but every moon going around the planets, could be worked out quite precisely and exactly. In fact, once again, he settled down with the NASA computer. He proceeded to work out the exact orbit of all the planets and all the moons, and again, all of them divided with absolute precision into this huge number that had been found at Nineveh. <coughs> But then he noticed something that seemed to him rather curious. So far it had all been incredibly, precisely accurate. Then he noticed that in the sixth decimal place, in fact, there was something very slightly wrong. It wasn't very much wrong, it was something like, you know, one twelve millionth part of a second or something. And he thought, you know, these people seem to have been so accurate. They seem to be far more accurate, in fact, than, you know, a modern mathematician working with NASA would be. So why did they make this small mistake? Then he remembered something interesting. The Earth is slowing down very, very slowly. And again, the amount is so small that it, it would amount to, you know, a second or a couple of seconds in the course of thousands of years. 16 millionth of a second or something per year. Well, when he took this knowledge into account and worked out when in fact the Quiriga and the Nineveh number would have been completely accurate, the answer was round about 68,000 BC. And for 68,000 BC it was completely, absolutely accurate. Now, you see what that appears to mean. It appears to mean that people in 68,000 BC had created the Nineveh number. So there were people around, not just people around, but extremely brilliant people at this time. Now, I'm, I'm going to stop in a few minutes because we're going to have a break. And then have some questions. Anyway. I'm going to rush the end of this story. Um, civilization, 100,000 years old, you know, it appears preposterous. And then I came across at least one very interesting clue. A friend of mine called Stan Gooch, um, who is um, an educational psychologist and fascinated by the paranormal, had also been fascinated by Neanderthal man. And he'd looked at some of the facts about Neanderthal man and discovered that he was far more civilized than anybody would believe. That far from being a shambling, ape-like creature with a receding chin, he'd apparently been quite an extraordinary sort of um, being. For example, in um, South Africa, he mined red ochre, which for some reason he used for religious purposes. But he'd not mined, you know, in a hillside, He'd mine millions of tons of red oak in this enormous mine. And I came across something on the net and just about um, a week ago. And the Neanderthal man had actually created a kind of superglue 
to glue the heads of axes to the hafts. He'd made this out of some kind of um, uh, some kind of stuff out of bones, which was heated to a great temperature, but when it dried, it was so solid that it didn't last forever. Another thing that came up a year or two ago, Neonatal Man made the first blast furnace. They discovered various furnaces at a place in Spain created by Neanderthals, and one of them was a blast furnace. Now, Neanderthal man quite obviously had a level of civilization miles above the average. So this seemed to me to be terribly important. Anyway, <clears throat> I was still trying to find out, nevertheless, who told Hapgood, and that got, what had got Hapgood so excited. Well, finally, somebody said to me, um, look, there's a guy in the middle of uh, Massachusetts, a place called Dover, that you might try um, getting hold of. Should I tell them the real name, darling, or do you think it's too dangerous? <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you the real name. His name was Bart Jordan. And a um, friend who rang me up said that uh, he was pretty sure Bart Jordan knew a great deal about all this. So I rang up this man, Bart Jordan. And a pleasant kind of voice at the other end of the phone said, yeah, it was Bob Jordan. I said, um, I'm trying to find out about Hatwood, who told Rand Flamath that he had evidence that civilization was maybe 100,000 years old. Do you have any idea where he got that from? And Bob said, yeah, I told him. And I said, what? <laughs> he said, yes, I told him. Anyway, I said, but why? Why did you say this? And he said, well, there are various things, he said. One, one, and the undertale man was far more civilized than we think. And so, what Bart had meant was, in fact, the answer to that question was the undertale man. But he said, secondly, the measurements of the earth show that people knew all kinds of things thousands of years before they should have known them. And one of these things is to do was a Greek measurement called the stada, you know, which we now know appears in the word stadium, you know, football stadium and so on. And it was a quite definite length. But when you work out Greek stada, you discover that the circumference of the earth measures precisely, and I can't now tell you the figure because I've forgotten it, but let's say um, 16,000 Greek stada. Now that's preposterous, it's exact and precise. And yet the Greeks didn't know the size of the earth. The Greeks didn't even know that the earth was round until fairly late, around about, you know, two or three hundred BC. The Greeks must have got their knowledge from some much, much older civilization. Well, anyway, ha um, Bart was a talker. My God, he talked for two hours solid. But... What was quite obvious is, is that he was brilliant. He knew the orbit of every planet in the solar system. He knew all the facts about the Babylonians and the Assyrians and all these other people. He was obviously a genius. But as I went on talking to him, I realized he was also rather a weird crank. He had some very strange theories. He was a mixture of genius and crank. Well, I ran round up and I said, hey, I found the answer to our problem. I found who told Hapgood. And I told him about Bob Jordan. To my amazement, Rand was terribly standoffish about this. He said, I think Bart's a fake. And I said, look, whatever Bart is, he's not a fake. He knows too much. Anyway, Rand wouldn't be convinced. He thought that Bart, Bart was an absolute um, total con man. And I said, no, he's not a con man. Well, <clears throat> Bart um, ran dug in his heels so hard that it was extremely difficult to convince him one way or the other. And he, was, he actually wrote to Bart in such insulting terms that Bart really blew his top. And I said to Bart, look, I would like nevertheless to put your theory in the book, if you don't mind. And this is what I did. I only introduced it briefly because Rand 
and was so against it that I put it briefly into the final chapter of the book. And in due course, the proof of the book arrived, and I didn't bother with it because I was busy with something else for about 24 hours. But when I finally did look at the proof, I was amazed. It was not my book. It was not the book I'd written. That bastard ram had gone through the book, taking up everything that he didn't like, including Bart Jordan. And I rang the publisher and said, what the bloody hell is this? We've got an agreement that Rand and I are writing the book together, and I've done all the actual writing. Why have you made all these changes? And he said, oh, well, hold on a minute, I'll put you on to the editor. The editor, a nice girl, said, oh, Rand assured me that you had agreed to all the changes he's made. Well, I was furious. I sent Rand an email saying, what the hell is all this? You, you completely cheated me, you bastard. And um, <clears throat> Rand wrote back, why don't you read your bloody emails? So Joy and I spent 12 hours looking through every email that Rand had written us over the past year, dozens and dozens of them. We couldn't find anything whatever that referred to changes I'd agreed to. And I finally wrote to him and said, look, which email? And he said, look at June the 12th. So I looked at June the 12th and then I saw what he'd done. He'd started an email, a 12-page email, by saying, marvellous, the book's finished at last, isn't it wonderful? And then I, he said, I took my dog for a walk on the beach, we were so happy about this, and so on and so forth. And then he went on to say, just a few more things for the appendix, latitudes and longitudes of sacred sites. And then he went on and on and on and on and on, for page after page, of latitudes and longitudes of sacred sites. Well, of course, naturally, I didn't both to read through them with any thoroughness. Halfway through, without even missing a line out to show it was a different subject, he said, by the way, I think this book would be greatly improved with this and a few minor changes. And then went on just to mention these two or three minor changes in about four lines. I think maybe we ought to take the chapter about Colonel Force and put it earlier in the book and that kind of thing. Now, I had replied to Rand's original email saying, Oh, marvellous, I'm so glad, that's wonderful. And of course, the bugger had probably turned to his wife and said, Ha ha, we've got him. Apparently got my agreement to make all these changes. Because he then went straight back to more latitudes and longitudes. Well, <clears throat> there was nothing I could do about it. I could have said to the publisher, Look, I'm not having this book published in this form. But of course, he'd already spent so much money on it that it would cost him thousands and thousands of pounds more. So I'd be forced to accept what this lousy bugger did to my book. And um, I haven't told anybody, <laughs> except you, <laughs> and I don't want you to go rushing off and telling the bright Argus, because I've got a very simple reason. The book has been out now for 18 months, two years. It's out in paperback. And if I now start rocking the boat very severely, it would simply cut off the sales of the book, both here and in America, where it's also appeared in an expensive paperback. What I'm going to do <coughs> is, as soon as the book has stopped selling, write a sequel in which I should point out exactly what Rand did. Yeah. 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 Oh, shall we have